this is Roger, thanks for dropping by. It's um, viewers' orchid question time. Um, I haven't got many questions, but um, <laughs> if I save them up and there's more added to them, the next one would be too long, so I thought it might be better to just do a relatively short one for a change. Right, that's just reminded me, <laughs> that's part of one of the questions, but I'll do it now. It's one of those annoying little black fungus gnats, and that leads into, <laughs> I was asked to have a look at my, and chat about, my pinguiculas. Which is going to be quick because I really don't know much about them, I just have some. Um, and they were got for that purpose. They um, deal with the fungus gnats. Carnivorous plants um, with sticky leaves such that this plant stuck to the one next to it. <coughs> Now, I never take these down from where they live, they never get tidied up, they just live there. So all these old flower spikes should be taken off, really. <laughs> Make the plant look hairy and untidy, but um, you know that's how it would normally grow, I suppose. But this little one, the first one on there, is always in flower. It's hardly ever got a gap. Um, the blooms are very delicate, quite honestly, and very attractive. Um, mainly shades of pink, um, pale magentas, through to sort of purpley colours. But this is uh, from a set which are called Mexican pinguiculas. Now it doesn't mean they necessarily come from Mexico, it's just a style of pinguicula that um, is based on how it reacts to temperatures between the um, growing season and the, what you might call a winter season. And um, if this plant stays warm enough, it will keep these leaves and it will stay looking like this. If it gets too cold, the leaves change their form and they become non-carnivorous and um, it goes into like a semi-dormant state effectively. And then some new leaves of this type will grow back again. And mine doesn't get cold enough for that to happen, so it just it even carries on blooming through the winter in here. So I don't know how cold it would need to get to change its form. Um, the native ones around um, the EU, possibly into the UK, I think we've got a native one in the UK. Not that I've ever seen it, but probably, probably tiny. And they're not like this at all. They have two distinct forms one of which has often got no leaves at all. Um, so if you're going to get some and you want them to look reasonable all throughout the year, providing your grow place don't get too cold, then you need to go for the Mexican pinguiculas. Um, as I said, it doesn't necessarily mean that's where they come from. Oh, I'm just taking some dead leaves off. As I've, for the first time in probably about six months, I've actually got it out of its tray. Now the problem with mine is they virtually run out of food because they've done their job too well, unfortunately. So the little black flies are down to next to nothing, so they don't get much to eat. But what I'm thinking of doing is when we get um, some weather that's predicted to be not, not hot and sunny, just normal sort of weather um, without rain. Um, and I might actually put them collectively as a set on a tray and put them outside for a few days, perhaps bring them in overnight um, but I doubt if the night temperatures outside are that much different to in here nowadays. Um, but yeah, and let them sort of get some flies stuck to them, get some food. <laughs> uh, now, the leaves are hairy, sticky. Um, if you touch them, they feel slimy. It's a different thing altogether. But for little insects, they get on there and can't get off. And then enzymes just dissolve them and turn them into food for the plant, which, are, which is absorbed through the leaves. So there's no opening and closing like on sundews and Venus flytraps and stuff, but they are still a carnivorous plant. And I find them very attractive, quite honestly. They took a bit of get, uh, getting hold of originally, but um, I found a place that is the, I think it's the Hampshire Carnivorous Plant Centre, which isn't too far away, and it was well worth the visit. Um, but, uh, having spent quite a long time, the, the guy who runs it was there on his own, and um, he was busy. I said, is it okay if I have a look round? He said, yeah, help yourself. If you need anything, give me a shout, and just carried on with his, with his work. 
And I spent ages looking round, and it was getting towards the end of the season, and a lot of the um, the pitcher type plants and the um, <laughs> tall ones with the lid on, a uh, really technical term, but they were starting to go over a bit, so there wasn't a lot that was really appealing, but I looked and looked, do you think I could find these pinguiculas? And in the end I asked, and I said, um, have you got any Mexican pinguiculas? And he said, yeah, you see that little door over there? They're through there. And in through there was a little tiny, like tropical jungle space that was heated, so it was hot and steamy. And they were in there. So uh, I did find them eventually. And I bought some actual real peat while I was there. Um, two people I know, that place and the place that grows the Deezers up... Um, up north of this country, I believe, like that, they have said their business will fail if they can't get peat because the substitutes don't work for the types of plants they're growing. So, uh, anyway, um, and as far as looking after these is concerned, um, I go by weight. So, when the pot, when I pick the pot up and it flies up in the air because it's so light, I fill the tray up with RO water. No feed, don't ever feed them. And, um, if I ever repotted them, they would need an acidic media, so peat, probably with some perlite and some grit, something like that for drainage, so that it doesn't compact and, you know, sort of turn all into a solid mass. But, um, yeah, I, I like them. Um, but any more in flower over here? No, this is the only one at the moment. But there are styles. That forms like a rosette, quite a tight set of leaves. I'll get another one out if I can dig them out. Um, but there are others <laughs> that still stick to the plant next door. <laughs> God, this needs to tidy up, doesn't it? There are others that have long strappy leaves and look more like that. Um, this is just old leaves, you know, that's uh, where I haven't tidied these up. These look awful. These could do with a little trim. Um, last time I tried to pull the dead leaves off like that, the plant came out in my hand. Oh, that one's got a little black fly on. So, actually, it's got several. So maybe they are... Oh, there's a live one there, struggling. So maybe they are starting to get about again in the grow room. Um, but anyway, if they're getting their own food, then great. So be it. Anyway, so that's the pinguiculas done. I'll pop those back in a minute. So we can cross that off. That was part of Pix, Pix Mahler's question. I'll do the rest in a minute when I get down there in sequence. Right, Elaine Riley asked a question about the benefits of keeping records. Now, I could do this in two minutes. I could take two hours, <laughs> which I won't, because I haven't got two hours to spare. But keeping records, for me, is part of the hobby. It, it's, I used to do it... Ugh, I used to do it so inefficiently, it's sad to even talk about it. I'm out here, my computer is up the other end of the room, literally, and this is like a double room, you know, so it's... it's a, and I used to pick up a plant, water it, put it down, pick up another one, and I'd do about three or four, and then I'd walk back to the computer and update my notes with things like, new growth has grown an inch, or new leaf started. And the, le the level of detail was ridiculous, quite honestly. I don't do any of that now. That section of my notes, bearing in mind I lost my notes and were recreated thanks to Zena, um, most of the detail's gone anyway, and I rationalised in my mind which columns do I actually use frequently and are of benefit to me. So it's gone from that wide as a spreadsheet to like that wide um, with just a few columns. So there is a notes column, which I use to fill in about the last repot, or the fact that I changed it from a pot to a mount. And if it was potted, what I use for the media and how the roots looked. That's all that goes in there. And it only ever gets dated, updated when that changes, like when I do a repot or change from a pot to a mount, mount to a pot. Otherwise, I don't update that section anymore. It just stays as it is. Um, the only thing I will do is, is put in red, repot now, if I notice a problem, yeah? But normally if I spot a problem, I'll deal with it there and then. I don't even get time to update the notes. So that's A column. Then obviously I've got the, the genus 
and the name of the plant, either the species or the hybrid name. So that's my first two columns, basically. There is a column or two that precedes the name that I use to mark a plant um, for a specific reason. Like at the moment, there's a yellow marker against all the plants to go. Yeah? <laughs> that's not so that I can ignore them, it's just that they're easy to find. Yeah? So I use that for some time. Occasionally, if a plant gets a, a spot treatment of a, a fungicide or a pesticide or something like that, I'll put that detail in that column as well. But apart from that, we've got the genus and the species. Um, we've got, I keep the date when the first bloom opens of a blooming, and I fill the date in when the spike or the buds are finished, basically. Now that gives me the length of time the, bud, the blooms last, but it doesn't, because it's not quite accurate enough. What about if it was a sequence of three spikes that opened in succession two weeks apart? I'd have it down as being in bloom for like two and a half, three months, when in fact the blooms might have only lasted three or four weeks. So that's, but that's how I like to keep that record. Um, uh, a historical view of that data is quite useful to find out if you've got an annual bloomer that blooms around the same time every year, because then you know to look forward to it. And if you've got a show or something coming up, you know to, um, you know, to get ready with your steak and all that sort of stuff. Not your steak and chips, your steak and ties. Um, so I keep the, the track of that. I used to have where I got it from and the date. So I knew how old the plant was and where I got it from, the seller, basically. Sometimes um, not necessarily the seller, but the event, like, you know, Malvern. I might have Malvern Equigenera, so that's the seller and the place. But I lost a lot of that data. So quite a lot of that column now has just got the year in it, because like I know I got it last year, <laughs> but I can't remember when. But um, that like, I can't update that. I can't get that information from anywhere. If it's lost, it's lost, you know. So, uh, so there's a fair bit of that went missing. Um, I then keep the date that I last repotted or mounted it, and I colour code that so that I know when I'm when I've just done a feed, like say I've done a feed for the holy clay pots, and I want to record that that's a column a bit farther down, um, I can find those easily because they're colour coded, they're in a blue colour. So the repotted date is in blue. So to update that part of my notes, I just need to look for blue in amongst all the other colours. And I use a brownie orange colour for mounted orchids. I just use ordinary black for normal sort of pots. And obviously my notes are divided up into sections. So I'll have like, you know, Mastervalias and Restrepias the, and Draculas, they're all in one section, cooler, shadier. My Dendrobiums are divided up into the types like Latorias, Nobilis, um, others. <laughs> I have to have an others. <laughs> Ones that don't really fit into any other type. Winter Resters is another category. I've got a Catlia type section, an Oncidium and an Alliance section, um, Sologenes. So I keep them clustered together so that um, if I want to have a look at the Sologenes, they're all nicely together with a heading, so I do that. And then, as I said, I update. The only um, column that gets updated regularly is the feed and watering column, where against each individual plant, I put the date and what it had. So whether it was a flush or what feed it had. So that would be what went into the feed if it's my normal MSU, I just put the TDS. I don't need to write MSU because that's what you use all the time. It's a bit waste of letters and puts too much in the column. So I would have something like um, TDS 250, CalMag 290. Yeah, because I added the CalMag in on top at 40 parts per million, sticking it up to 290. And then I record the pH as well. That's useful to know whether it had a low pH last time and a high pH. It might need a high pH this time. And also it might just have a date and flushed. Okay, so benefits of records. You can also keep photographic records because this ain't so good. Not over a three or four year period when you've got 
dozens or perhaps even hundreds of plants, can you remember exactly what it looked like a year ago? So photographic records are very, very useful. Historical view, um, you know, perhaps once a year, take a picture of your plant, or once every six months, or even once every three months, depends how many you've got, and how much storage space you want to use up. That's what cloud data is for, cloud storage and things like that, where, where you just pay a bit and use it. Um, but nonetheless, photographic records are really good because it'll, it's also a good way of recording a problem. Then you can revisit via the photo and think, right, that's what it looked like three months ago and today it's, it's getting better. But otherwise, you know, things happen in the orchid world sometimes very slowly. Yeah. So photographic records are useful. So there are benefits to keeping records. Some people keep none. Some people have one of these that just, you know, the <laughs> elephant never forgets sort of syndrome. I'm not like that. I remember the silliest of things, but stuff that's really important sometimes I have trouble with. Mm. It's like I can remember lines from a film that I haven't seen for 30 years, and I'll see a clip of the film somewhere or other, and I know exactly what that person's going to say next. Well, what's, uh, that is useless information. <laughs> clutter, clutter up here, getting in the way of good stuff. So um, that was Elaine Riley, benefits of records. Some see a great benefit of them, some don't bother. Personal thing again, yeah. But it helps me with, I like to know how long I've had a plant. And unfortunately, I have lost a lot of that data. Talking of um, how long I've had plants, it could be one of these opening the box soon. I bought some plants. Um, they should arrive, what's today? Friday. He might arrive tomorrow, if not, probably Monday. Um, right, so that's that. Uh, Carol Sykes asked about um, cattleya type. Um, I think it's an individual plant question. It's growing a sheath, so it's obviously mature to growth. It's pushing a sheep up, sheath up. It's pushing out new roots, and it needs a repot. Should it be done now, or left until after it potentially blooms? The, I didn't find out whether the sheath's actually got buds in. Um, Debatable. The two schools of thought. Some people say if you interrupt a, a plant's flight in progress as it's producing its buds, they could blast. Um, I don't find that with cattleya types. I think whatever they're doing, they will get on with it in the main. And I still say the most important factor is the timing with the new roots irrespective of what else is going on, irrespective of time of year. If you miss that slot, which might only be two or three weeks long, because sometimes those roots push out at a phenomenal rate. Well, if they get too long, they, they're pretty brittle, and you're now going to start, you know, mucking about, trying to get old media off and getting it out of the pot. Good potential for breaking root tips. And again, if they're too small, and you do it a bit too soon. They are so delicate, you've only got a sneeze in the next room and they'll break. So, you know. Um, but I've found that cattleyas are set back far, far less and recover far, far quick if the repotting is done via the timing on the roots and forget everything else. I've repotted cattleyas in full bloom because they just happen to be those type that mature their growth, put out the blooms and then start their flipping roots. The roots can come on cattleya types almost any time from a tiny little new growth to half mature to fully mature to halfway between the maturity of that one and the start of the next new growth in that gap there. They just suddenly start putting out roots when they were effectively not dormant, but sitting there doing nothing. You know, where they just sit there looking at you thinking. <laughs> and you sort of think, well, you're going to do something. Oh, I might do, might not. Just sitting here quiet at the moment. You know, that, that period that they seem to get. Um, right, so that's that. I would suggest if the roots are in a good position to repot, then get on and do it. And I always go like this, if you lose the plant, you ain't ever gonna see the blooms again. If you lose one set of blooms, you will get them again if you look after the plant. That's worst case scenario. I suspect it will be fine. So that was question one. There's more. Ugh, question two. Carol Sykes getting her money's worth. 
Right. <laughs> I use the expression, yeah, feed well when actively growing, or, you know, feed and water well. You've heard me say that sort of thing. And she's asked, when she is feeding well, should she still flush? Uh, yeah, it's not a yes and no answer, but it's a depends. Um, if you're growing things bare-rooted or growing on mounts with so little moss it's negligible, you hardly need to flush anyway, because there's nowhere for those salts to build up. Yeah. However, if there is somewhere for them to build up, you need to flush, doesn't matter what time of year it is. What I adjust is the frequency. So, for instance, in winter, when plants may not be growing much at all because of low light, short days and low temperatures, they could get a flush every other time. And the feed they get in between isn't much either. Come the growing period, when I am feeding and watering well, I can go three and sometimes with the mounts four times before I flush, but I still flush. So if there's any chance of stuff building up anywhere, my mounts are a mixture. Some have got next to no moss, some have got a lot, because I've got quite a few Oncidium types mounted now. That's a relatively new thing. But they hold their moisture longer. Um, there is potential for some build-up, so they, they, they get flushed. Um, and if I'm flushing my mounts, I do all of them, even those that don't really need it because they're virtually bare-rooted on their mount. Um, do I flush my vandas, which are totally bell-rooted? Yes. When I change the water in the vanda bucket, when it comes in here, it's clean. It's RO water. And they get a dunk and a slosh around in the RO water. That's their flush. Then they don't get another one until they change the water again. So I would say yes, the flushing still needs to be there, but possibly adjust your frequency depending on time of year and what your plants are up to. So that was that. Uh, oh, next one's an easy one. Look at a plant. It's done much better after a few slurps. Right, somebody with the longest flipping channel title in the world. A good channel though. <laughs> Cloud Forest Vibes, Orchids and more. Again, it's a channel, quite a lot of the Orchid channels are that. They are Orchids, that's it. But there are quite a few that have incorporated other types of plants as well. Often carnivorous plants, because similar conditions I suppose a lot of the time. But not always. And this person would like to see... <laughs> It's, this, this has had practically every part of its name changed and I'm, I'm not doing it. I'm sticking with the name that I bought it with because of the hassle I had buying it. It's my Oncidium Varicosum Rogersii Baldin. The name and a half, isn't there? Well, I should put a pop up for that. But it stopped, it ceased, it rotted its latest growth and it was gone. It was in a pot. And I thought, you've never done that well in that pot, you're going on a mount and it sat there, and it sat there, and then finally, I think the last time we looked at it on film, it had this tiny new growth at the back end of the plant, not the front where the um, growth rotted off. So what's happening with it now? <coughs> A little new growth has pushed on quite nicely. As I say, it's not from the very back of the plant, but it's also growing roots, and there are roots coming out of the oldest pseudobulb. So we've now got some root growth progressing, hang on, where's my camera, reasonably well, because that one's come out and, you know, it's still got a growing tip, one here. But then, oldest bulb, next one, next one, rotted growth. And it's pushing out a new growth that got trapped under a piece of, um, piece of the tie. But it's managed to squeeze its way out, just about, so it now has a second new growth that hopefully will grow on. And we've got roots coming out from here now as well. So this is producing new roots from the oldest bulb, the newest bulb, <laughs> and the one in the middle is the one with the new growth. And that's producing some new roots. It's made it. It's going to make it. Now, this growth will push on. It may get to the point where um, it wants to bloom. 
I will be reluctant to let it because it produces quite a large spike. And for an Oncidium, the blooms are quite large as well, which is part of the reason I got it. Partly size of the blooms and the other part was just, it's basically two colours. It's the bright golden deep yellow that you get on Oncidium Dancing Ladies type. But the top of the plant is virtually black and just that pair of colours, I love it. I'll do a pop-up, I've got a picture. I might have a picture. I lost a lot of my photos as well. Um, anyway, it is growing. It's doing roots. That's something it hadn't done for a while. Quite a few. And um, new growth is progressing and it's trying to produce yet another one. So I'm happy that that's made it now. It's a long way from being a good plant again. But these older pseudo bulbs didn't shrivel as bad as they could have done. You know, this oldest bulb is still quite fat. It's got the lines on it. But that's how they are. That's, that's, that's not shriveled. That's just the shape they form as they age. So that's that one. Name about eight foot long. Oh, I don't know how long this video is. Um, for those who haven't heard the story, I'll do it quickly. That plant was in a display at an RHS show in London. Now with the RHS shows, the day before the show opens, in the evening, everything is judged by the RSA, RHS judges. As soon as the judging is finished, you're not allowed to touch your display. It has to stay like that for the duration of the show. You can't rearrange it, you can't add stuff in or take stuff out, it has to stay like that. If they catch you, you can be kicked out or not allowed back in ever again. They're quite hard on that. So this plant was in a display. So I uh, went up to the guy um, and I said, um, I'd like to buy, there were three plants there, I'd like to buy one of the um, Oncidiums in the display. He said, I can't sell you anything in the display. I'd be in serious trouble. <laughs> so I said, you're not listening. I want to buy one of your orchids. I didn't say I want to take it away with me now. I want to buy one. So are you prepared to sell one at the point you're allowed to, which is at the end of the show? Uh, yes, I suppose I can do that. So we haggled over the price and um, I got it at a price I was pleased. This is quite a few years ago, so it was mm, a reasonable price, I'd say. Not high, but not cheap. Um, and there was no negotiation. I wanted that plant. And I'd already persuaded him to do something he didn't want to do. So um, I got out my card and he said, oh, I can't take cards. He was from Peru. <laughs> He's not going to take a card in the UK, is he? So I can only do cash. I ain't got any. Well, hardly. <laughs> I had enough for a coffee and a cake, I think. Rattling stuff, not rustly stuff. So um, I thought, how the hell can I get some money? I didn't have a clue where the nearest cash point might be, but not in that building, that's for sure. Um, wandering around the streets of London trying to find a cash point did not appeal to me. So I went up to a trader I know well um, from this location, Lawrence in fact, Lawrence from Lawrence Hobbs, and I said, Lawrence, what? <laughs> he always says that if you say hello, you go, what? <laughs> I said, if I give you my card, can you give me money? <sighs> and I said, and it's real cheeky because I don't want the money to buy any of your plants. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, what do you want? So I, I, I told him what I wanted, give him, give, give him my card, he did the thing like that and handed over the folding stuff. So I was right, now I've got the money. Um, now this was a two day show and I'm there on day one and I can't have the plant till the end of day two. So I've now got to work out a way of that plant getting to me. So uh, what can I do, what can I do? Go and have a chat with Arthur from Burnham's. Quick look round, is Sarah about? Nope, right, go and have a chat with Arthur. <laughs> Sarah likes things by the book, you know, so, yeah, but Arthur, is more of a mate, he'll do you a favour. So I said, Arthur, what? <laughs> I bought a plant from that guy's display over there. What? What? You'll get him kicked out? Says, da, da, da. Panic not, simmer down. It's all okay, it's in hand. Well, I'm not getting involved with all that. I said, yes you are. <laughs> Your involvement is, if I get the guy to bring you the plant at the end of tomorrow, when the, clo the show has finished, Will you take it back to Burnham's and then post it to me as though it was one of your plants? 
he was desperately trying to think of a reason why, he's, why he can't do this and couldn't think of one. So he said, yeah, I can do that. You'll have to pay the postage, though. You'll have to do that now. So I got my card out and paid for postage on a plant that hadn't even been bought from Burnham's. <laughs> and that's how I did it. So I got the money from Trader over there, um, paid the guy for a plant I couldn't take away with me, he then took that plant over to Burnham's and Arthur took it back to Burnham's with, when he packed up and, and went back to Burnham's and then the next day he packaged it up and posted it to me. So that's how that plant got here. So it's precious. And that procedure took two hours to get through that lot. Yeah, so I fought for that one. I'd made up my mind I wanted it and I wasn't giving in. And it's coming back to life. That exact clone of that particular plant, I would probably never ever get again, unless that guy from Peru happened to be in this country selling plants and had bought one with him. Otherwise, I don't think I'll ever see it again. Um, so that's that. Right, last set. This is a set of questions, but sort of links. This is Pix Marla, the rest of her question, because the first bit was the pinguiculars. And she asked about fungicides. I will get the two that I've got. I will be in a minute. And you have to bear in mind there are quite a few EU countries where you can't get anything. It's all been banned. Um, and a fair bit of the stuff in the UK has long since gone. I do have another one that I, I can't show you because to actually own it is an offence, let alone use it, because it's a very old-fashioned one that got banned about 20 years ago, which I managed to get a hold of. It's lethal stuff. I can understand why it was banned. It will kill anything, and that includes these things, people. It's vicious stuff in its raw state. So um, I've only ever used it once, and it stinks. So I, di I didn't really want to use it again. <laughs> It was, I used it in the middle of the week, and it was a weekend that Hannah was coming down, and she wouldn't come out here. She said, I'm not going out there, that smells revolting, it's getting in my throat. So, so she didn't even come out here. Right, so these are the two I use. There's that one, yeah? And the, I'm just trying to find the low level chemical, I doubt if I'll be able to focus on it anyway. Um, but it's systemic and um, a surface one, so it works in both ways. Um, it will kill things on the surface of the leaves and the stems and stuff and then it gets absorbed into the plant and retains its um, powers. So I'm still trying to find what's in it. <laughs> Never easy, they always keep it hidden away. Oh, I can't see it written anywhere. Uh... Well, unless it's on the bottle, perhaps. Ugh. Ah. Right, now I don't know whether I'm going to be able to get this to focus, but it's written in tiny letters on the very, very bottom of the label. It's the last line on the label. I'll see if I can hold that still enough. Uh, we could try this autofocus again, couldn't we? I don't know whether that worked or not. Anyway, uh, you can either read it or you can't, but there's not much else I can do. So that's what's in it, and you can also see, if you can read it, why I'm not attempting to pronounce it. So that's one. And then the other one I use, which has been around quite a long time, um, but I've got a horrible feeling that um, it's either been pulled for the from the market because the manufacturer was bought up by a company in France and they're very anti-systemic stuffs. Yeah, so it may have actually been pulled. Um, but that's that one. Um, that's been around a long time as a systemic fungicide. I've, I've had that around for a very long time. Now let's see if we can find what's in that as well. Uh, blah, 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 blah. They spend more time telling you what not to do with it than they do what... Oh, blimey. Right, it's... I'll have to use that autofocus again. There's a black oblong there, 
and what's in it is one or two lines above so it's just there where my finger is and I'll tap on the screen and see if it will focus on it let's get it in the right place on the camera now I don't know whether you can read that but that's about as good as it's, oh, that focus thing's gone off try it again Anyway, that's what's in that one, and I think what's in them both is virtually identical. There may be one or two letters wrong. So those are the fungicides I use. They are both systemic. Um, I may be able to get access to another one, which is a it's an what I call an industrial one. Normal folks can't have it. You have to buy it under license at something like a drum, you know, like 30 gallons at a go. That's in its raw state. So. Um, Normal people can't have it, but I know somebody who's got it that is licensed to buy it and to use it who might bottle a small amount for me. Um, it's incredibly good for a protective element through the winter when you're going to get the cold and damp. It puts like a coat on your plants and looks after them during that period and stops anything nasty getting at them. But whether I can do that or not, I don't know still to be discussed when there is such a time that we might actually be able to stand a couple of feet apart and actually have a discussion which hasn't happened for a long time right general purpose uses of the um isopropyl alcohol 70 percent the hydrogen peroxide h2o2 three percent and the cinnamon they all get use, they all get talked about, they all get named, but I don't think I've ever said exactly what I use them all for individually, if you see what I mean. So I'll just quickly go over that and then that's it for today. Right, the alcohol has a killing effect based on rapid evaporation. That's why a lot of the hand sanitizers are based on that alcohol at that sort of percentage. You rub it on your hands and they're dry in like 10 seconds because of the rapid evaporation. It's that evaporation that kills stuff, not the alcohol itself as such. So that is good for sterilizing tools, but you need to stand the tools in there for a while, give them a slosh around, make sure they're nicely coated up like that, and then put them somewhere to dry off quickly. And it, again, it's that evaporation. And with cutting tools like scissors and things like that, you can actually flame them. You can flame them on their own, or you can set fire to the alcohol. That's not as good as flaming them on their own, because when the alcohol burns, it's not the actual liquid that's burning, it's the fumes. So the actual, like a, a scissor blade, is flaming away nicely, nice blue flame and everything, and the scissor blade's not even warm, so it doesn't do the job properly. So you're better off, if you're going to use a flame to sterilise, just use it. You know, otherwise use the alcohol. It's not a lot of point in trying to do both. Um, so it's a sterilizing thing. It can kill pathogens and stuff like that. Potentially it can kill bugs on plants. But because of that rapid drying effect, um, it can also have an adverse effect on plants, especially on tender young growths. It can actually damage the cells because of that rapid evaporation. It's just sucking all the moisture out and evaporating it not ideal to use. I've used it as a wipe on things like Phalaenopsis, nice big thick fleshy leaves like that, cotton wool swab, soaked in alcohol, wipe it, that'd be brilliant for things like spider mites, take them off and possibly kill those that are left due to that evaporation. But it's not strictly speaking a bug killer, but it will kill off things like pathogens and stuff like that as a sterilizing solution. So that's that one. The hydrogen peroxide, um, I use, only use that at repotting time and I give the whole of the base of the plant, um, base of the pseudo bulbs, where the sheaths are, the whole root system are sprayed with that and again that will kill pathogens, uh, mold spores and things like that. It might take out the odd bug or two but I don't know that for a fact but I know for a fact it will fry slugs and snails. <laughs> those little tiny snails that they're in there and you can't find them and they hardly ever come out to play so you don't see them but they're in there chewing the ends of your roots off and if you get a bit of a plague of those they can be very damaging the H2O2 will take them straight down 
Now, <coughs> an ideal thing if you thought, like I think I've got some on one of my big, big mounts, um, the Anosman. Um, it's possible. Um, the ideal solution would be to dunk the whole mount in H2O2. I have to pay six or seven pounds a litre. To dunk a mount that size, I'd probably need five or six litres. To dunk a plant, cheaper to go and buy another plant. So, you know, it only ever gets, from my point of view, as a spray. It goes in a sprayer and I use the spray to do the plants at repot time to clean up the base of the plant, make sure there's none of those slugs or snails in there and make sure that all the mould and anything like that is dealt with. So that's what I use the H2O2 for. for. And it's good stuff at 3%. I know people that use it at 5% without any damage done. Um, if it works at 3%, you're going to pay quite a bit more for 5% probably. You might think it's worth it. But just remember that <clears throat> once it's activated and done its job, it turns into water. The, the two on the end goes. So instead of being H2O2, it becomes H2O. That stops fizzing. That's just water. So in theory, you don't even need to rinse it off once it's done its job. Um, I still rinse it off on the grounds that it may have landed in a place where it didn't get anything to work with and didn't get to fizz and it's still H2O2. So I usually give it a rinse off. Um, good stuff though. Um, I've often thought about going up to 5% but um, I don't think the difference would be worth it. Um, and everybody I've ever heard of that uses it, apart from a couple, use it at 3% and it seems to do what it's um, designed to do. So that's the hydrogen peroxide. Um, I don't know who thought about spraying plants with that first. <laughs> I bet all the other orchid growers are oh, these newfangled daft ideas. That's what people use to put blonde streaks in their hair. <laughs> I think, I don't know. Um, anyway, was there an expression? Peroxide blonde? Donkeys years ago? Imagine putting that stuff all over your head. Not for me. Right, cinnamon has, um, I won't say it's healing properties, but it has properties that when put on cuts, wounds, it seals them, stops infections getting in, it has those sort of properties, and dries the wound, which also helps stop any rot or anything forming because there's no moisture. It dries it out fast and has that type of property that stops infections getting into the area. But you need to take care of what you put it on because it does that wherever you put it. So if you put it on some of your delicate new roots, it'll do the same to them and dry them right out. Probably kill them. <laughs> so make sure it goes on places like when you cut a rhizome, yeah, when you're splitting plants and things like that. That's what it's good for. Um, also, if you get bacterial rots on everything and you have to do serious surgery really fast to stop it, everywhere you do that fast, that cutting, get some cinnamon on it and it will hopefully stop the infection getting into where your cuts are if there's any left around. And that can include slicing leaves. When you've got the large fleshy leaves like on Phalaenopsis and there's something going wrong and you cut the leaf in half to stop it spreading back towards the crown, do the edge of the leaf with the cinnamon. It's, it's good stuff, it works. It'll dry the edge but then it's never going to look good anyway. You've cut the leaf in half. So, so. Anyway, so that's that. And that endeth today. Um, I was going to go out tomorrow and do an orchid hunt, but the weather is um, debatable, as our weather always is, and I want to combine it with um, something else, and I haven't got time to organise that something else, so I probably will leave it till next week. I've got a specific place in mind I'd like to go to, and I don't want to leave it too much longer, or some of what I'm going to see will have gone over. So, you know, it makes the trip less worthwhile. Um, so I may do that tomorrow. I may, well, I don't think I will. I think I'm going to leave it till next week. Um, so, that's Orchid Question Time number, number... Actually, I might have to stop numbering them. I'm running out of fingers. I think it was 12, so a round dozen. They don't need a number on the end, do they? So that's that. Um, and for all those who've taken any notice of my <coughs> request for the watchers 
to please log in and actually subscribe. There seems to be a fair few who have actually done that because the number has gone up. I wouldn't say it's gone up dramatically, but any, any upward movement on the subscriber numbers is a big thank you. Um, so again, I'll ask again, anybody that's out there that's not subscribed, um, I'm not asking you to turn the notifications on, that's a different thing. I get enough flipping emails in my mailbox without having YouTube battering it, so I don't do that. That's fine, I'm not, but just subscribing to the channel, it does no harm to anybody or anything, but it can help me quite dramatically reach that 10K. Um, so it's greatly appreciated for those that have done it, and a plea for those who haven't to just, you'll need to log in, um, and then just hit that subscribe. That's all you've got to do. And then log out again and forget you even did it. Yeah, <laughs> but it would be appreciated. As I said, the numbers have climbed up a bit. But um, YouTube are having some sort of routine type of clear out or something or other I've caught wind of where inactive channels are, they're got at basically, and they basically unsubscribe them from wherever they're subscribed, which is why some people suddenly become un unsubscribed and they haven't done anything and they have to go back and subscribe again, even though they've already done it once sometimes twice. That's YouTube playing games. There's nothing anybody can do about that. But I would say that if you use your YouTube channel and actually log in and actually leave a comment now and again, you won't get that trouble. It's the ones that are just what I call an inactive, they're just a channel created to go onto YouTube and watch stuff. But if you don't log in, you can't comment, you can't subscribe, you can't use that, you, know, you certainly can't load videos and things like that not without logging in. But you can watch everything you want. So that's what a lot of people do. But if you can, please subscribe. It really will help. Um, and thanks for those that have. And I will see you next time. I know it's a long video because my coffee's cold. <laughs> Bye for now.